Well, welcome everybody to our online service. We are so glad you've joined us. We have an awesome service oh, today. Service. Um, our friend Lauren is gonna share a little bit of her story, mm -hmm. so powerful, and, and lead us in a song. And um, uh, of course, Ty is bringing the word. He has a great, great sermon um, for us. So we're, we're just excited. Uh, but before we get into that, um, we have just a few announcements for you, especially if you're new. Yeah, we are going to have our three in-person services on Sunday at 9, 30, 11, and 5 p.m. So we hope to see you guys there. Uh, also, The Loop is our e-newsletter that has all the details and everything going on at GVC. We've got really awesome things coming up like Diaper Drive for Hope Clinic um, and the Fall Fest, which is going to be coming soon. Uh, just so to stay up to date on all that, you guys can subscribe to The Loop at graceat.org slash loop. And then, as always, we believe here at GBC that giving is an act of worship, and you can do that a couple ways. You can mail checks to 1300 South Maple Road here in Ann Arbor, um, or you can give online at graceh2.org slash give. All right, let's, let's get let's into it. it. <laughs> uh, here's, here's Lauren for us. Hi, my name is Lauren, and I have the opportunity to sing Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. This song has meant a lot to me over the years, and I learned to love it even more after December 2020 when I was diagnosed with breast cancer at 26 years old. That was a huge shock to me and my husband Nolan, and we were just devastated and really a wreck by that. And then a month later, we learned that the cancer had spread to my liver. Um, therefore making it stage four breast cancer. We were pretty hopeless, really just down in the dumps, feeling like, you know, we weren't gonna be able to get through the next couple of months. But thankfully I was able to dive deeper into scripture and get involved here at church and just spend time with the Lord. And he really has sustained me and helped me get through all this. Uh, part of having breast cancer is trying to find other people that you can relate to. And so I've joined a couple support groups with women who are under 40 who have stage four breast cancer. And through talking to them, I've learned that a lot of them really don't have any hope. I have just felt so blessed uh, to have the hope that I have in Jesus because not everyone has that. Um, so Yet Not I really has stuck out to me with some of the imagery and lines in the song. Um, specifically, I love how it discusses Jesus as our good shepherd and how when we're in the valleys, he will lead us and bring us peace and joy and have mercy on us. I also love the line that says, oh, the chains are released, I can sing, I am free. Um, because I've really felt just burdened and held down by my diagnosis. And so knowing that one day I will be free with Jesus in heaven just gives me so much hope and peace in my heart. And I also just appreciate how it repeatedly says that my hope is only Jesus. Um, so yes, you and I will face trials, we'll have suffering, maybe pain, maybe just, yeah, terrible times, but to this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold Oh, hell. 
how strange and divine I can sing all is mine yet not I but through Christ in me chapter 4. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, 
Why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you? For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor, working with our own hands. When we reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? I imagine that many of us have heard or have seen some version of the story of Peter Pan, the magical boy who chases his rebellious shadow into the room of some children that are living in London. He and his sidekick, a fairy named Tinkerbell, are from a land called Neverland, a place where children never grow up. They just have adventures all the time. And so he convinces these three, these two brothers, and their older sister named Wendy, to travel with them to Neverland, which they do. And when they're there, they get caught up in all of these adventures, including battling the evil Captain Hook. Well, the story has many twists and turns, but eventually Captain Hook is defeated. The two brothers and their sister Wendy return to London and Peter Pan and his crew, the Lost Boys, are invited to join them and to stay in London under the care of these children's parents. And yet they decide that they don't want to. Instead, they would rather stay magically young and mischievous forever, and so they travel off back to Neverland, the end. Now, although it doesn't exist in any diagnostic manual and it is not officially recognized as any sort of mental illness, there is a syndrome, at least a colloquial syndrome, that is commonly known as Peter Pan syndrome. Have you ever heard of this before? It is a syndrome that affects young adults more often than not, it is said to affect men who simply refuse to grow up. Like they don't want to have any responsibility of their own. It's like we have a number of lost boys and maybe girls in our society, in our culture, that just want to have whatever adventure comes along as opposed to any real adulthood. And Books have been written, lectures have been given, memes, of course, have been made about how difficult adulting seems to be for many of us. Well, today's text is a direct challenge to those that would prefer to be Peter Pan than to grow up to be the, an adult in the room. We are in week four of our First Corinthians sermon series. And it just so happens that we are in chapter four as well. We have laid out a bunch of context of this ancient Greek city. We've talked about some archeology. span We've talked about some of the philosophies that were sort of swirling around in that culture. And we mentioned how the church there had started quickly and beautifully in many ways. And that city that was filled with various gods and different practices and countless people who are arguing their various philosophies 
Paul traveled and he decided that he wasn't going to present his message like all of the other orators or poets or lecturers. Instead, when he showed up, he got there and he told them a very, well, kind of straightforward message in some senses, and yet in others, it was something that was so counterintuitive that they struggled to wrap their minds around it. Essentially, what he said is, listen, there is a God who loves you and has created you, and his name is not Zeus or Apollos or Aphrodite or any of those other gods that you may have heard about before. This God loved you so much that like any parent who would do whatever it takes for their children's well-being, including any parent who would say, hey, I would die so that my kids would be able to live and flourish. This God named Jesus came and did just that. He died so that those of us who are willing to repent, to turn from our old lives and our own gods and trust in him, we might be saved. Now, yes, we still die like other people seem to die, but this Jesus resurrected from the dead. And so for all of us who trust in him, we now have a victory over death. We have an inheritance that will never spoil or fade. All we have to do is repent, believe, and be baptized, and we too will be saved. And so Paul went and he gave that message. And when he did it, the Spirit of God stirred that message in their hearts away from all of these false gods, away from all these different practices, away from really anything that poses as a God in their culture or in ours for that matter. I mean, away from the God of fat paychecks and away from the God of degrees and upwardly mobile children, all of which might be good, some of those things. The Holy Spirit stirred their hearts to know this Jesus and they did, and, and they became this church almost overnight, a relatively large church for that time period, and it was definitely a young church, a church where there were a lot of sort of immature believers, and this immaturity would rear up its ugly head. And so Paul, who was their founding pastor, wrote them this letter to help them understand what it looked like to grow up in the faith, to no longer be a, a Peter Pan in their faith if you will. Now, we have covered a lot of information in the last few weeks, and so if you haven't seen it, we've talked about the structure of this letter and all kinds of things. Well, these letters were written a little bit differently than ours, and so I was looking up a way to try to give us a quick glance at how these ancient letters written by the Apostle Paul were actually structured, and I found this, which I thought was kind of helpful. Go ahead and take a look at that. This is a general Pauline letter outline. Essentially, almost all of his letters go like this. Grace, I thank God for you. Hold fast to the gospel. For the love of everything holy, stop being stupid. And Timothy says hi. That's pretty much the way all of these letters work, including this letter to the Corinthians. We are in the section, which is, for the love of everything holy, stop being stupid. And that section actually takes up most of this letter. Now, the specific way they're being stupid in chapter 4 is that they have caused divisions. They're sort of getting puffed up about themselves in pride. And it turns out that one of the ways they're being stupid is that they are refusing to grow up in faith. As Pat talked about last week, they were acting like spiritual infants who are not yet ready for, for kind of solid food. They were being childish in their faith. As he writes through this chapter 4, there's a point here halfway where it almost sounds like he's starting to get a little bit sarcastic. And as we mentioned earlier on, he has somebody who he's maybe working with when he's writing this letter, who's maybe writing down what he says, named Sosthenes, we believe. And so as he's talking, it's almost like at some point Sosthenes is like, hey, Paul, like you're getting a little off track here because the language sort of switches halfway through that chapter. Maybe you saw it as it was being read to you before. But for our purposes today, we're going to look at this in two parts, only two parts today. The first part is Paul versus Peter Pan, and the second part we're going to look at is the kingdom versus Neverland. So let's start with part one, Paul versus Peter Pan. Look again at verse one. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And then down in verse 15, Paul describes their behavior, and he says, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. 
So Paul contrasts his behavior, how you should regard him, versus how they were acting. And when he describes himself, he, he basically says that he is a, a servant, one who obeys. They are someone, like Peter Ban, who sort of like resists authority, right? Lots of guides, but, but very few fathers. L look just for a moment, if you will, at, at that word that we saw in that first verse. This is how you should regard us as servants of Christ, which brings us to our Bible nerd moment of the day. Paul uses a very interesting or unique word here for servant. Now, there's other ways. Doulos is generally the way we see the word slave or servant appear in the Greek New Testament. But here he uses a different word. He uses the word huperitas. Now, huperitas is basically the word that was used for somebody who was an under rower. So, so unlike a wartime galley, one of those ancient ships where they had all of those guys who would be rowing, there would be a captain calling out commands and you would see on the lower level, all of these servants, all of these slave types would be rowing in step, in rhythm with the command that was being given. So, I mean, some of us may do that sort of thing at a CrossFit gym. Actually, we have a picture here of the Apostle Paul in his local CrossFit gym. I know, it's a terrible joke. I'm a terrible joke. I'm sorry. But these rowers that he was referring to, they were always rowing when they were commanded to row. And this is how Paul described himself. He said, look, the adult in the room, me, essentially, when God says row, I row. When God says go, I go. When God says no, I know. Like I just like I just do what he says. I am obedient. Part of what it means to grow up in faith, to mature in faith, means that over time we become more and more like Jesus. And one of the ways that God helps direct us, one of the things that he uses to help us learn to be obedient are authority figures that have been given to us in our lives. What we find out is that these Corinthians did not like having authority figures. They didn't like being given direction from parents and coaches and teachers and bosses and mayors and governors and all of these people. They didn't like that at all. They were a bit like, well, like Peter Pan. And he says, listen, you guys have lots of guides, lots of people that you will listen to for advice or for life hacks or can maybe speak a little bit, and you'll take a little bit here and take a little bit there, but you don't have many people that are speaking authoritatively in your life, except for me, and you're not even listening to me the way that you should. They were incredibly resistant to any sort of authority, which sort of makes me wonder, what about us? I mean, we're Americans, right? Like. At the very core of our identity is a story about resisting the authority that was over us. And now, to celebrate our independence, we grill things and blow things up, right? I mean, that's like who we are. At our very core are a people that say, don't tread on me, don't mess with me, don't tell me what to do. We don't want to listen to parents or bosses or teachers or coaches or doctors or police officers or, or governors or presidents. Or We just say, hey. I will be my own authority. And yes, sometimes authority may need to be resisted, but we need to recognize that for many of us, resisting authority has become our default operating system. And this was not the default operating system of Jesus or of the New Testament writers. Now, you might say, well, wait a second. Um, I think Jesus resisted the religious authorities of his day, and you would be correct in that. But he was also trained under a local rabbi's authority, in all likelihood. He also was worshiping at the local synagogue. He was going to temple. He was submissive to governments that were trying to kill him, and he was obedient even unto the cross. When you look at the life of Jesus, you don't see primarily a resistance to authority. You see God himself even submitting in a way to these authorities that have been placed over him. When you read Paul and others and their writings in the New Testament letters, you don't see a consistent theme of resistance to authority. You see things like honoring the empire. You, you see things like submitting to, to uh, hu husbands and wives and all of these kinds of things. You see a, a system, a group of people that believe that growing up in Christ likeness means not being like Peter Pan, not being resistant to every authority that is placed in our lives. If you're wondering if you're somebody who's a little bit resistant to authority, 
Don't ask yourself, huh, am I somebody who's resistant to authorities, like in some general sense? Ask yourself really specific questions. Like, am I resistant to my parents' authority? Because you might say, well, I have no problem with authority, just that my parents aren't very whatever. I have no problem with authority, yet like I think that that's a good thing, but my boss is kind of a jerk, that's why I slack off all the time. Well, it's just that this coach, this teacher doesn't like me. We have an excuse for why we're always resistant, which sounds well, a bit like Peter Pan. And so Paul contrasts himself and how he is obedient to the call of God like, like a slave rowing a boat versus them who are willing to have lots of guides, but who are unwilling to listen even when their pastor is speaking directly to them, this authority God has placed in their lives. Now, as we continue to look through this, we see that he doesn't just contrast them in this regard. He contrasts them in some others as well. Look at uh, that same verse 1 again. This is how you should regard us as these underrollers, as servants of Christ. And he uses a second word, as stewards of the mysteries of God. When he describes them, he says in verse 7, the second half, What do you have that you did not receive? If, you, if then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Basically, when Paul contrasts himself, the adult in the room versus them, the Peter Pans in the room, he says, I steward blessings, you brag about blessings. I steward them, and you seem to brag about them. Now, what is a steward? A steward is a house manager, one who recognizes that the place where they live is there because of the owner. That the influence that they have, the, the, the opportunity they have, the access to whatever wealth might be there, it is all an opportunity to serve their master and to steward what he has. They recognize that everything is about somebody else's glory, not theirs. And that is how Paul describes himself, that he is somebody who has been blessed, but the reason he has been blessed is to be a blessing for God, to, to, to expand God's kingdom. And he says, look, we, we steward this thing. We, we, we manage it for the glory of God. You, on the other hand, he says, you, on the other hand, you have these blessings. You're, you're like kings and rich and puffed up and all this stuff. And, and you, you brag about it. You act like there's something special about you that brought you to this point of of wealth or influence or whatever. The old football coach, I remember saying once upon a time about a rival football coach that that rival coach was born on third base thinking that he hit a home run. And what, what he was saying was that this person had been given this brilliant opportunity and all these, these great athletes to coach and then he coaches them and they succeed. And of course they succeed because they had, were fantastic athletes to begin with. And yet this person is walking around like they are some kind of big deal. They're beating their chests and they're bragging as if their abilities and their gifts are all meant for them and are all the result of, of their skills. When a little kid drives one of those toy Escalades, you know, the, like the battery operated ones with the stickers on it and the whole thing, and they act cool about it and they, you know, they wear little sunglasses whenever, which our kids had one of those. It's kind of cute when they're four and when they're five. But if some 16 year old rolls up in his dad's Escalade and acts like some kind of big deal, well, then we want to take our little kids and hand them our keys and say, go draw a picture on that guy's door, right? Because there's something really unattractive about somebody who ought to realize that everything they have has been given to them from someone else, that they ought to be humble. These Corinthians were impressed by their own gifting and their own station in life. They had come to believe that these things that they had were for them and from them and were part of their very identity. I was recently listening to this podcast by Malcolm Gladwell, where he re revisited a chapter from his book called Outliers. And essentially what it was in this podcast was that he went to Columbia University, this, this great academic institution, and he brought all of these seniors in and he gave them a survey and he asked them to write down some things about themselves. And what he wanted to do was see if he could demonstrate some common links between these students, some some things that had happened to, to put them in this amazing sort of privileged uh, position there at the school. And so they filled out these surveys and then he asked, he assigned them numbers and then he asked them and he said, listen, what do you think, what unique leg up do you have 
on some of the classmates that you went through school with that it brought you to this point right here. And so they sort of wrestled and they posited different theories. And, you know, some of them said, well, maybe it's that our zip codes, you know, that were from wealthier zip codes. And that is the common factor that brought us here. And he said, nope, that's, we didn't have the time to figure that out, right? He said, nope, that, that's not it. And they said, well, you know, maybe it's that we all had private tutors that were hired for us or whatever. And he said, nope, that's not the common factor. Well, maybe we're from certain ethnic backgrounds. He said, nope, that's not the factor. He said, there's one thing that seems to bind all of you together. And they were kind of like waiting, you know? And he said, you were older than your average classmates that you went through school with. In fact, you are, many of you are a year, even a year and a half older than many of the kids that you were in class with. You, your parents sent you to school when you were a little bit later than some other kids. So that when you were in kindergarten, you were like six months or 12 months older than most of your classmates. Think about how big of a deal at five, six years old, six or 12 months is in your development. And so each of you actually were given this huge, like it was nothing that you had anything to do with. You were given this opportunity to be the oldest, most mature kid in the class, and then you succeeded. So what do you think we should do about it? And then, amazingly, all of these kids that saw demonstrated that that was what it was. They said, well, nothing, nothing. I want my score to be my score, and I want this certain situation because they had internalized the blessing that they had received as if they had deserved it and this is who I am. That is exactly what was happening with these Corinthians. They had internalized their opportunity, their spiritual gifts, the wealth that they had been given, and they thought that that meant that they were somehow special. And Paul goes, no, 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 no. If you have lots of money, steward it well. If you have lots of smarts, Steward them well. If you've been given a great education and this influence, steward it well for the glory of God. We, he says of himself and Apollos and Peter and the other sort of apostles and teachers, we are stewards of a mystery. You're just bragging like you had something to do with it. The third thing that Paul says to differentiate himself from the Peter Pans in the room, you can see in verse nine, for I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. When he talks about their behavior, he says in verse 5, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before, before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. When Paul describes himself, he says that he has been sent to publicly suffer. While these Peter Pans are sitting in their little seats of comfort and making all kinds of judgments about which they don't know anything. Paul was so captured by the work of Jesus that while there's nobody who wants to suffer, and he didn't want to suffer per se, he understood that part of his role was to suffer publicly and suffer well. That as a leader, as a pastor, as a man who was growing up to be more and more mature in faith, that part of his calling was not to privately suffer in silence somewhere, but it was to demonstrate the goodness of God even in very, very difficult circumstances. He alludes here to an ancient practice where an emperor or a military general, general would come into the city after a, after a battle that was won, and they would have behind them a whole train of prisoners. And at the very end of that parade or that train would be certain prisoners that were captured, certain enemies that were then condemned to die. And part of the big celebration of the victory of this general would include a public execution of all of these prisoners. And he says, it's as if evil and death still think that they rule this world. And so they're making a parade, a a spectacle out of us is one of the words he uses. And it's like, we are the very last in the line. We are being condemned to die. And they think, evil and death, that they can take us out and that is somehow going to announce their victory. But God knows. And in the end, all of our suffering will be turned by God into glory. Elizabeth Elliot, Christian author, speaker, superhero, basically. Her husband, Jim Elliott, was killed in the 50s when he was attempting to make missionary contact with a, a people group in eastern Ecuador. 
And after, she, uh, after he was killed, she spent a couple years of her life going back to those same people and being a missionary there. But one of the things that she said that I just find super profound, and I just ran across this last week, was, if your life is broken, it may be because pieces will feed a multitude. What was she saying? Well, she had a Paul-like understanding. If you're going to suffer, it may be because your suffering is intended to nourish and comfort others. That in some way, God is going to use those hardships to bring himself glory and to encourage other people. Well, what did Peter Pans do instead? Well, the Corinthians, on the other hand, were sitting in their relative comfort and they were sort of acting like know-it-alls. Paul said, you, you know, you have all this wealth. You're like kings. I kind of wish you were kings and then maybe you could invite me into some of uh, like the treasures of a king. He says, you sit there like you're on some sort of judgment seat or some sort of throne and you issue all of these proclamations that you think are so wise and it really just reveals you to be a fool king. You keep trying to choose between different leaders. Listen, None of us wanted you on our team. We're all on Team Jesus here. You know, Apollos and Peter and I, we're, none of us were trying to gain a certain following. And yet you sit there in your comfy chair, running your mouths as if you know what you're talking about and you don't. Every parent has experienced this with their children. There are times when kids will start arguing. I mean, we've been at our dinner table, at a table that is my wife and I, it's our table. The food is the food we put on the table. And then our kids will be arguing about something. And I mean, when they're younger, not, not now, of course, but they'd be arguing about something. And there were times where I'd be sitting there thinking, stop it. Can't you just be nice to each other? And also, neither of you even know what you're talking about. You are both so wrong in what you think and how you're handling it. And that's what Paul's saying. What are you guys even talking about? The one who work, who's actually doing the work, the one who is suffering is us, the apostles. We're the ones who've been hungry and thirsty and all of the things that he mentions there. You know, can you imagine this happening? I mean, of course we can. This happens all the time with, uh, uh, with sports fans of opposing teams. I mean, imagine you get two sports fans from opposing teams. Neither of them even went to the school that they're so passionate about, right? Neither of them have ever played high-level athletics. Neither of them understand the nuances of the plays of the schools or the cultures, and yet they scream at each other like they actually know what they're talking about. By the way, I read an article recently about these sort of different rivalries in schools, and they're all essentially the same, that there's one school that was kind of, uh, that was pursuing certain kinds of academic things, and the other one was more of an agricultural school, and that the one school that was pursuing different things besides agricultural gets viewed as the arrogant suck-up school, and the other one that's the agricultural one gets viewed as the simpleton hillbilly school, and these two fight each other forever based on nonsense, nonsense. People identify with these things, not because they really understand the cultures of those schools or even what's going on in the field. They identify with just an idea of the school, and then they start making snap judgments about each other. And that's exactly what was happening in the Corinthian church. These people had not suffered in any way. They didn't know what it was like to lead a church, to go hungry, to, to, to struggle with the things that Paul was struggling. They didn't know that. And yet they were there saying, oh, I'm team this, I'm, I'm team that. And he's like, knock it off. You have no idea what you're talking about. You might be a Peter Pan if you make broad, sweeping, judgmental strokes about your brothers and sisters in Christ. And you might be Peter Pan. You might be Peter Pan if you are somebody who is quick to argue. You might be Peter Pan if you think you have really great advice that other people need to hear because you just really understand the problem even though you've never lived for a moment in their shoes. You might be Peter Pan. And the call of the adult in the room is to suffer well not to fly around thinking you can just drop little judgments on everyone and everything. As I read this chapter and I was thinking about this Paul versus the Peter Pans, right? The adult in the room versus those that are spiritually mature. There was one thing that I kept coming back to that was sort of troublesome to me and it was something I was wrestling with and it was this. If growing up in the faith looks like obedience, stewardship, and suffering well, then why bother? Why don't we just all be Peter Pan? 
Which brings us to part two. Part two, the kingdom versus Neverland. This, this idea of why bother, why, why even try to grow up at all, we wrestle with that because we have listened to the lies of Neverland. Neverland tells us a story. It tells us a lie that goes a little bit like this. Being a Christian simply means that I do a couple of religious practices and I sort of mentally agree that Jesus died and the tomb is empty. And once I do that, I can live my life however I want. I can shirk all responsibility. I can just basically live in complete and utter freedom and it doesn't really matter because I have been given the pixie dust that will allow me to fly, fly away to heaven someday. So really being a Christian is about just having this pixie dust, golden ticket, whatever you want to call it, into heaven, and it doesn't necessarily change anything about, or doesn't need to change anything about my life now. I can focus my life on building my kingdom as long as I've signed off that I'm on Team Jesus. Neverland tells us that we will be fine as long as we just have that little kind of flavor of faith, you know? And then we can actually expend our efforts on flourishing in this life. Because if you want to flourish, spend it on your kingdom and just make sure you got the pixie dust in your pocket. In fact, Neverland tells us that growing in faith might actually be dangerous. That if you center your life on Christ, and that might mean that, well, he has something to say about your life. I mean, if Christ is your everything, then he can tell you what to do sexually. If Christ is your everything, he can tell you what to do with your money. He can tell you how to raise your children. He can tell you all kinds of, if he is really the center of our lives, then we would have to like, I don't know, bend our knee and listen to him. Now, if you are a servant or steward or a sufferer like Paul, then essentially you're giving up your whole life. So why would you do that if you could just kind of go on your merry way and be like, Peter Pan. Did you catch what Paul said right here at the end of this chapter? He said, For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. He, he contrasts this kingdom of talk versus this kingdom of power, this Neverland lie versus the real kingdom of power. They loved talking about every philosophy, and they may have loved talking about the message of Jesus as just another story that you might choose to believe. And he said, listen, the message about the kingdom of God, that faith in Christ is not just, oh, check, check, I'm good, I'm good. No, no. It is about bending the knee to King Jesus. It's about becoming a citizen of God's kingdom. It is allowing the Holy Spirit to stir our hearts to faith and then mold and shape our lives into his likeness. It is real power in the gospel that changes us. Imagine a young couple in their mid-20s. And they've been together for a number of years. And, you know, they've said, I love you to each other. And they hang out most weekends. And they've celebrated each other's birthdays, you know, and done a couple holidays, whatever, met each other's parents, the whole thing. And imagine that the woman in this couple gets offered a job on the other side of the country. And so she wants to talk to her boyfriend about it and say, hey, like, you know, help me make this decision. So she goes to him and she says, hey, honey, you know, I love you. Oh, honey, I love you too, right? And she says, listen, I I've been given this job opportunity on the other side of the country and I've saved up enough money that I can put a down payment on a house there. But before I start doing that and making all these plans, I just need to know like where we are. You know, like, do you love me? Oh, of course I love you. Okay, great. I okay. So then what do you think is next for us? And he says, well, well, I mean, I, I don't really know. And she says, well, do you see, like, maybe marriage might be in our future. Oh, whoa, whoa, you just said the M word. I know, I know, I know I said the M word. But I, I need to know what you mean when you say that you love me. Does it mean that you enjoy being with me? Oh, yes, honey, I enjoy being with you. Okay. Does it mean that I factor into your decisions? Well, listen, I, I kind of like my freedom, you know. But does it mean you can see us together in the future? Well, look, I like keeping my options open. Well, I, listen, I need some insights about my decision. Is there an us or not? And imagine that this guy said, listen, I think we're fine right now. And I like fine. Let's just stick with fine. 
you know, I, I know you have big decisions to make. And I know when you say you love me, I believe you. I believe in you. Yeah, of course. So when you say that, if what you mean is that you want me to own half of the house that you buy, I guess I can do that. And if it means that you want to cut me into your inheritance, your family, I mean, that's cool. But like, I, I mean, I'm just, let's just, I'm fine. Now, if that woman came to you after having that conversation with that guy and said, I'm really struggling, what do you think I should do? Wouldn't you say, uh, leave that loser? He's saying he loves you. It just means that he likes being around you and he's willing to take something from you. He's not committed to you in any way, shape, or form. Just move on. Now, no matter who that woman was, you would say that, but let's kick this up a notch. Let's say that that woman in that illustration was actually um, extremely wealthy, uh, drop dead gorgeous, compassionate, humble, brilliant, kind, like all of these wonderful attributes, right? Like, let's just say she has everything that anybody would look at and go, wow, that's the full package. Imagine she came to you after having that conversation with him and said, yeah, he said he's fine with half my house and half my inheritance, and he's fine with being fine, but he will give me, he's very noncommittal. Wouldn't you be like, you could have any, like there's so many other choices for you. Why are you bothering with this person? I didn't want to tell you this before, but you've wasted your time. Get out of that relationship now. Okay. So let's imagine that Jesus came to you and he said, when you say you believe in me and you love me, what does that mean? Like, like, you throw those phrases around, just what does it mean? Do I factor in to your daily life and your decisions? Am I somebody that you're like happy to be around? Or is it somebody that you wanna couple, do you wanna couple your life with me? I know you're happy for my, to take my inheritance, but is this like more than just words? Is there actually power beneath this? How would you answer that? I know how Peter Pan would answer it. I also know how Paul would answer it. He, he writes in a different letter. Philippians 3 says that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and might share his sufferings becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul longs to grow up in faith. He just wants to know Jesus more and more even if it means suffering. Do you know why? Do you know why he wants so much more of Jesus? It's not because Paul is the brilliant, compassionate, beautiful, blah, blah, blah person. No. No, he recognizes that he is the loser boyfriend. <laughs> that he is the one who has very little to offer. And yet God, who had every right to leave those losers and choose some different options, reached out to him. Sent Jesus for him gave his life for him. So he's not satisfied, Paul isn't, with having a faith that's just fine. He wants this love, this relationship to flourish. Do we? He's not worried about faith making his life worse. He can't imagine anything better than walking in faith with Christ. He's not trying to keep some options open. He's a servant. He's a steward. He is a spectacle of suffering because in the end, it's all glory. So for us, where are you struggling to obey today? Where's the Peter Pan in you fighting that obedience thing? For us today, what have you been given that God is asking you to steward? Where, where's that Peter Pan part of us? It's like, he wants to brag about it as opposed to steward something for his glory. And for us today, how are you responding to suffering? Have you been praying that God would use it for others? Or are you like Peter Pan, just trying to sit in a little comfy seat and judge everyone else? This is the call of grown-up faith. May we grow in our wonder and our thankfulness to Jesus so that we might leave the lies of Neverland behind. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ty. Uh, Brent, would you close us with a reading from number six? Yes. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Have a great week, everybody.